not completely limit a person to a predetermined set of answers. Instead, some questions are open to allow the respondent to give their opinion in its entirety, which can reveal information that otherwise may not have been collected. The responses may also lead to being asked more questions or to skip those questions that might not be relevant. The advantage of personal interviews over mail or telephone surveys is that the researcher has more ability to target the audience of interest and the response rate is higher. The survey was constructed of four main components. The first asked fishermen questions that fishermen typically refer to as fish talk. Things like, how often do you fish here? What are you fishing for? And what types of bait are you using? These questions collect useful information, but also build a rapport with the person and builds conversation that will put them more at ease when asking them more difficult questions. The second section assessed the angler's awareness of non-native species and their knowledge about them. And the third section assessed the angler's awareness of mercury advisories and whether or not they are affected, affected their fish consumption habits. The fourth section was a card given to the angler at the end of the survey with multiple choice questions that asked for some demographic information, such as total household size, total household income, education, and age. Now that I've explained how and where I conducted my research, I'd like to explain why each of these topics is important and report the study's findings. I'd like to give some background on the history of non-native fish species in the Everglades. Like I mentioned before, the Everglades is dissected by hundreds of miles of canals that are often connected to urban areas. These canals have served as corridors for species introductions for decades. Florida has the second most established non-native fish species than any state in the country. In many cases, the establishment of non-native fish species results in negative impacts on invaded ecosystems and native biodiversity. The subtropic climate and reproductive ecosystem of the Everglades provides suitable water temperatures and an abundance of food. Two species of fish, the butterfly peacock bass and the grass carp, were purposefully introduced by the FWC after extensive experiments that studied their possible impacts on the ecosystem. However, releases of other common aquarium species, such as the Oscar, Mayan cichlid, and sailfin catfish, have resulted in reproducing populations that could possibly have negative impacts on native fish species. In total, over 22 non-native fish species are known to reproduce in the Everglades ecosystem. Considering the prevalence of non-native fish species in the Everglades and the known role of anglers in the spread of non-native species, I had several questions to ask. The first was, what species do anglers prefer? Also, are anglers aware of the presence of non-native fish species, and what do they think about the non-native fish species? I also wanted to know, do anglers understand terminology associated with, with them? And do anglers care about conserving the, their native fish species? The first hypothesis I tested was that anglers prefer to catch native fish species. I, I tested this hypothesis by asking anglers, which kind of fish are you targeting today? which kind of fish do you want to catch the most? If anglers were not confident in the names of fish, a photo picture guide was provided to avoid confusion that might come from uh, among common names and avoid language barrier issues. Afterwards, I categorized the responses into native and non-native fish species. Data showed that 65% of anglers were targeting native species only, with 19% saying they were targeting anything, and 12% listing both native and non-native species. Only 4% named non-native species only as their target fish. The percent, when asked what are your favorite species, anglers became more specific, with only 8% saying they were fishing for anything. The number of non-natives only were increased to 72%, and the percentage of people fishing for non-natives as their favorite rose to 10%. Looking at the responses of boat anglers and canal bank anglers separately, there is a significant difference in the distribution of the anchor type responses. Boat anglers named only native species 25% more than canal bank anglers. Canal bank anglers said they were fishing for anything more than three times as frequently as boat anglers. Canal bank anglers also named native species as their favorite more frequently than they listed them as their target of the day. Approximately 10% of canal bank anglers and boat anglers identify non-native species as their favorites. I hypothesized that a majority of anglers were aware of non-native fish species. I asked them, are you aware that many species of fish found here are not from here, to avoid confusion that might arise from the words non-native or exotic species? Out of the sample, 79% said they were aware out of 355 anglers interviewed. Of canal bank anglers, 
72% said that they were aware that, of the presence of non-native species, whereas 90% of boat anglers were aware, a difference of 18%. Using other information through the survey, I wanted to see if certain traits or variables could predict whether or not anglers were aware of non-native fish species. Using 13 variables hypothesized to be correlated with awareness, a logistic regression was performed for the entire sample and the two angler groups. The regression for the entire sample found that frequency of fishing, years of experience at the location, education, and angler type could predict awareness. The model found that having a bachelor's degree or higher education improved the odds of knowing about non-native species by 5.5, and some college education increased odds of knowing by 4.3 compared to an angler without a high school education. For every one unit increase in ships to the location per month, awareness increased by 20%. And for every year of experience at the location, the odds of being aware increased by 3%. A regression analysis is also performed for boat anglers. Due to the very small number of boat anglers that did not have Using the same variables, a regression analysis was also conducted for in independent angler types. Among canal bank anglers, those with a bachelor's degree or higher and those with some college education were 4.2 and 3.5 times more likely to be aware of non-native fish than an angler with less than a high school education. For every year of experience, the chances of being aware increased by 3%, and for every trip to the, to the location per month, the chances of increased by 40%. The same analysis was also performed for boat anglers. Due to the very small number of boat anglers without a high school education, they were categorized with students with a high school education. Once again, education played a large role in being aware. Anglers with a bachelor's degree or higher were 17.8 times more likely to be aware of the presence of non native fish species than anglers with a high school education or less. Anglers with some college education were 6.4 times more likely to be aware. Males were also 38.5 times more likely to be aware than females, but this is largely due to the very small number of female boat anglers in a group. Anglers with a household size of one or two were also 5.2 times more likely to be aware than a household of three or larger. Next, I wanted to know if anglers understood scientific terminology associated with non-native species. I asked anglers if they were familiar with the term native species, and then if they said yes, I asked them to tell me what it meant to them. I repeated the same two questions for the terms non-native species and invasive species. Approximately 85% of all anglers were familiar with the terms native and non-native species, but only 62% were familiar with the term invasive species. The percentage of anglers who could give accurate definitions for each of those terms decreased, with less than 45% of anglers able to give accurate definition of invasive species. There was a significant difference between canal bank and boat angler knowledge, with a higher percent of boat anglers being familiar with the terms and being able to give accurate definitions. The third hypothesis was that a majority of anglers would have negative opinions about non-native fish species. Anglers can have a variety of opinions, and responses were categorized into four types of answers positive opinions, negative opinions, positive and negative, and neutral. An example of a positive response reported was, we like to catch them, they seem under control to us. The cichlids do well in the canals. An example of a negative response is, they do mess up the ecosystem for the fish here. People release them into the canals. And for a neutral response, I'll deal with them, I'm not gonna kill them or anything. Most anglers had no opinion or were neutral about non-native species with 37.9% choosing that option. And a close second, negative only was the second most frequent response type of anglers. Canal bank anglers were neutral twice as frequently as boat anglers, with 46.8% uh, compared to 22.4%. The, the distribution of responses was significantly different between the two angler groups. 
My fourth hypothesis was that anglers support conservation of native fish species. To test this, I asked anglers to choose the response that best matched their level of agreement with two statements. The first statement was, management decisions that will benefit the future of native species are important to me. And the second question was, it is important to me to conserve native species for future generations. I asked them to choose their level of agreement based on a five-point Likert scale of ranging from strongly agree to strongly disagree. Results show that it is important to anglers to conserve native species. 82% of anglers strongly agreed with statement one, and less than 1% disagreed. More anglers strongly agreed with statement two than statement one, showing a significant increase in the importance placed on conserving, conserving native species for future generations. The only difference between angler types was that boat anglers strongly agreed with statement one more frequently than canal boat anglers. In summary, my study found that a majority of anglers interviewed were aware of non-native fish species. A college education was a strong predictor of awareness for the entire sample and both angler types individually. Although most anglers could explain the difference between non-native and native species, only half were able to recognize invasive species as being potentially harmful to the ecosystem. Studies have shown that people often learn about non-native species from television, magazines, and the newspaper. As stated earlier, informed anglers are less likely to transport non-native species. Environmental awareness campaigns are very useful in educating the public, but are often expensive and it would be more cost effective if targeted groups of people who have little knowledge of the problem. This study found that significant differences between the awareness of canal bank and boat anglers and their knowledge. Previous surveys have found that support for eradication programs is higher among people who were previously aware of non-native species issues. This study also found that anglers prefer to catch native species and place importance on conserving native biodiversity. Similar to to a previous study, support for conservation did not differ among groups of higher income and higher education levels. Environmental education is vital in forming support for conservation of native fish species. Although it is impossible to predict the cumulative impacts of non-native fishes on the Everglades in the long term, providing understandable information to stakeholders could potentially prevent some anglers from being part of the problem. The second topic of my study focused on angler awareness of mercury advisories. Many of you have probably heard of mercury advisories for fish that you might buy in the store, such as tuna. Eating fish can be an excellent source of protein and has, provides health benefits for cardiovascular health and prenatal development. However, the bioaccumulation of mercury is one of the most toxic in the food chain has been known to make some fish unsafe to eat. Mercury is one of the most toxic and studied pollutants in fish and is stirred on the United States Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. Over 90% of mercury in Florida comes from the burning of coal. As you can see, when coal is combusted, mercury becomes airborne, able to travel hundreds of miles before it being deposited by wind or rain. Once in the water, bacteria can convert it into a molecule that can be absorbed by living organisms, but is not easily excreted and then accumulates every level up in the food chain. Fish like the largemouth bass can accumulate high levels of mercury because of their roles as the top fish predator in freshwater ecosystems, which can then be passed further up the food chain to people that eat them. Luckily for humans, we aren't often eating, so instead we accumulate mercury throughout our lives, which can have serious health consequences. High levels of mercury can cause reproductive failure in humans and wildlife alike, and also causes impaired prenatal and neonatal brain development and low birth rates. Mercury poisoning can also cause paresthesia, which is a sensation of burning and stinging pain on the skin, and also ataxia, which is a loss of voluntary muscle control. A pollution event near a fishing village in Japan in the 1950s caused thousands of people to lose muscle control and give birth to children with visual and cognitive disabilities. Mercury poisoning is difficult to diagnose and is very difficult to treat. Today, the most common routes of exposure to people are consumption of cassivorous fish and dental fillings, dental tooth fillings. Despite the majority of the Everglades being remote, South Florida is among the hotspots for mercury deposition. The Florida Department of Health annually tests fish and releases advisories for species, specific species in specific locations. 
Sport fish have kind of been found to exceed concentrations deemed safe to eat by the EPA. And a previous survey of Everglades anglers in 1995 found that a majority of anglers were aware of advisories, but were not responsive in their eating habits. Considering the persistence of high levels of mercury found in fish since that study, and the building body of research of health impacts of mercury, I wanted to learn how anglers in the Everglades perceive mercury advisories today. The first hypothesis I tested was, but the first questions I asked are, are anglers aware there are mercury advisories? How often do people eat fish from, that they catch? Do people adjust their eating habits because of the advisories? Do anglers find it important to improve water quality? And also, what do people think about the mercury advisories? The first hypothesis was that anglers are unaware of the existence of mercury advisories for the area. <coughs> the survey found, uh, I asked them by asking, are you aware of the mercury advisories for this region? The survey found that 69% of anglers were aware there were advisories. Assessing the two angler groups separately, I found that 88% of boat anglers were aware, but only 58% of canal bank anglers said they were aware of the presence of mercury advisories. Once again, I used a logistic regression analysis of variables thought to be associated with awareness and found five variables that together could predict awareness. The strongest predictor of awareness was angler type once again, finding that boat anglers were almost six times more likely to be aware of mercury advisories than a canal bank anchor. Frequency of fishing at the location increased awareness by 20% for every visit in age and changed their location per month. Age was also a strong predictor. Anglers between the ages of 48 and 57 were 10% more likely to be aware of advisories than anglers under the age of 37. But anglers 58 and older were almost four times more likely to be aware than anglers under the age of 37. Distance also played a role in the awareness of the anglers. With anglers who lived, lived less than 30 miles uh, from the site being more aware than anglers living more than 30 miles away from the site by a factor of three. Anglers with a total household income between $40,000 and $60,000 were also found to be 2.5 times more likely to be aware of advisories than someone in the household earning less than $20,000. <coughs> when analyzing angler groups independently, I found three of those same factors were able to predict the awareness of mercury advisories for canal bank anglers. For every fishing trip made to the location per month, awareness of anglers increased by 30%. Age was also associated with awareness of canal bank anglers. Anglers 58 and older were 3.4 times more likely to be aware than anglers younger than 37. Distance from home was also associated with awareness of local advisories. Anglers living 30 miles from the location <coughs> location were, or more were 3.8 to 4.3 times less likely to be aware than, advice, than someone living <coughs> far closer than 30 miles. Possibly due to, due to the small number of boat anglers who were not aware of the advisories, logistic regression did not produce a model, model suitable for predicting awareness for boat anglers. My second hypothesis I tested was that most anglers do not change their eating habits because of the advisories. Considering the frequency of fishing at the location had an effect on the anglers' awareness, I decided to remove the 48 people who were fishing at locations for the first time to research their consumption habits. Of the remaining 307 anglers, 41% had eaten fish from the area in the last year. Of those 127 anglers, 73.2% were aware of the mercury advisories. I asked them, do the advisories cause you to eat less fish? 46% said the advisories did not cause them to eat less fish. Adding that 46% that did not change their consumption habits if I were aware to the 28% of anglers who, who were not aware of the advisories, angler types were different when it came to fishing and consumption habits. <clears throat> Twice as many canal bank anglers said they were fishing for food. Sorry. 
Angler types were different when it came to fishing and consumption habits. Twice as many canal bank anglers said that they were fishing for food compared to boat anglers. Almost four times as many canal bank anglers and boat anglers gave part of their catch to other people. Of the anglers who kept their catch, 49% of canal bank anglers ate fish at least once per month from the area, compared to the 35% of boat anglers who did keep some part of their catch. My third hypothesis was that anglers found it important to improve water quality. Anglers were read two statements and were asked to choose their level of agreement from a scale ranging from strongly agree to strongly disagree, similar to the questions asked about non-native species. Statement one read, management decisions that will decrease mercury and improve water quality are important to me. The second statement was, it is important to me to improve water quality for future generations. As you can see, strong, anglers strongly agree with both statements. Similar to the results of the non-native species questions, anglers strongly agreed with the statement concerning the importance of future generations more frequently. There was no difference in responses between boat anglers and canal bank anglers. I asked the fishermen a few more questions about their presence, about their perspectives of the advisors. When asked what the what the reasons were for releasing fish they caught, when asked what the reasons were for releasing their fish, 23% of boat anglers cited health risks as a possible explanation for why they released their fish, compared to only 10% of canal bank anglers. I also asked, would you choose fishing spots differently if you knew there was better water quality? Canal bank anglers said yes 83% of the time, compared to only 55% of boat anglers, who said they were often just fishing for sport. Angler groups also responded differently about the effectiveness, about the perceived effectiveness of mercury advisories. Only 19% of canal bank anglers thought they were being informed enough, compared to 41% of boat anglers. From these surveys, we are able to see that being aware of advisories does not necessarily mean that they are being used. Comparing the awareness of anglers in a study conducted by Fleming in 1995, there is no significant difference today in the percentage of anglers who are aware of the advisories or in the percentage of anglers who change their eating habits. Observing canal bank anglers and boat anglers separately, we can see that boat anglers are far more aware of the advisories and eat fish less frequently. Other studies have also shown that shoreline fishermen typically have lower income and are less aware of advisories than boat fishermen. Some studies have suggested that boat anglers may be aware of advisories because they are often visible near boat ramps. However, in this study, however, great, there is great variation in the effectiveness of signs, newspapers, and television ads. Studies have shown that advisories are often dismissed if eating guidelines are difficult to understand, if anglers hold beliefs about how to judge water quality or if they have a belief about, if they have a disbelief about the harm contamination may pose to them. This study found that approximately 10% of canal bank anglers shared their catch with others. If anglers have negative opinions about mercury, they are less likely to convey the information to family and friends, which may put children and pregnant women at risk. Previous studies on the effects of mercury exposure to fetal, to fetal and childhood development and the low awareness among non-angler household members supports the need for better communication and consumption guidelines to the general public. In conclusion, angler awareness of non-native fish species is high, but improvement can still be made in educating the public about the possible impacts of non-native fish species. Although a college education was associated with increased awareness among all anglers, I doubt it was because they all took a course in ecology or environmental studies. Instead, I hypothesized that anglers who have pursued higher education were more likely to research and educate themselves on their hobbies. Television and newspapers have been successful in raising awareness of the general public in South Florida to non-native fish species. Awareness campaigns have already made the snakehead a notorious monster in the Everglades, even though they were not found in the water conservation area three. I recommend that non-native species impacts be a part of environmental education programs before high school that non-native fish information be more accessible to anglers, and to continue to identify groups of stakeholders who are underinformed. It was clear to me that older generations of anglers were more knowledgeable of mercury advisories, and that anglers who often fished for food did not take advisories seriously. 
public awareness campaigns of the past seem to have lost their effectiveness, and younger generations are not educated on the causes and effects of mercury. I believe that simple exposure to updated science would encourage anglers to find more information. In my study sites, I never saw any posted signs. Because boat anglers have high awareness, I would post signs in areas that have, have high volume of canal bank anglers or shoreline anglers. I also think that it would be beneficial to a majority of people in South Florida if the advisories released by the Florida Department of Health were also available in Spanish. So I'd like to thank uh, my committee, Dr. Reed H. and Joel, as he's now instructing me to call him, and uh, Dr. Bob. Um, I also like to thank the FWC, Baron Moody, and Vance Crane, who provided me with uh, color handouts of non-native fish species to hand out to all my uh, people that I interviewed, and also Jeff Klein for sharing some of my information and talks. I also like to thank Jason Osborne at Everglades National Park, who took me out for some of his fishing surveys um, at Flamingo Park. And I'd also like to thank Florida Coastal Everglades LCER, who I am a member of, and I was uh, and paid for my trip and participation in the uh, third an uh, annual, triannual meeting in Colorado. And then also thank my lab mates and friends for all the help that they've given me and supported me through the uh, years here. And I'd also like to thank my mom and my family. And here my references. <laughs> Freshwater. It still has higher than uh, normal background uh, levels of mercury that you would find. Um, in the, in, like, say, the Florida Key, uh, you know, the Florida Bay. Yeah. In, the, in salt water, too? Or is that yeah, in salt water. Mm -hmm. um, from what I know, even uh, the mercury content in, in fish, ocean fish has, has been increasing. Um, there are certain parts of the Everglades that have been measured with higher levels of mercury that seems to be in areas where there's more water flowing and deeper water. Um, that also experiences dry downs in the dry season because it is converted into methylmercury uh, through uh, reducing sulfate reducing bacteria. Um, but there, there are maps of uh, grids across the Everglades of the different uh, concentrations that are found, and a lot of times it's correlated with the, the flow of water. Flow of fresh water? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Mike Ross. How come they don't like uh, native fish? Fish, what, what, uh, what don't they like them? Well, um, boat anglers were more against non-native fish than the canal bank anglers. The canal bank anglers tended to actually have no opinion or have no no negative comments about them. The boat anglers seems to also always refer to um, the Oscar. Uh, and the snakehead that were going to deplete their bass fishing because they most of the time they were targeting largemouth bass. And they had, to them, they said they had perceived declines in, in bass populations and in, in bass health. Um, so that was usually their, their reason. By predation or by? Yeah, by predation. So mercury is kind of like an invisible poison, you know? It's not like, I mean, the out ecosystem looks pretty good. Mm -hmm. So, I, I guess my question is, if the, if this were any different, like a conventional toxin, do you think we would have as management problems, or like you could see degradation, you could see poison, you could see toxic barrels and stuff like that? Oh uh, yeah, uh, that's another reason that I think a lot of people were very surprised when I gave them a copy of the Mercury Advisories and explained to them the advisories after I was done was because they thought that. They said, you know, look around, you don't see, you can't see any factories, you don't see any pollution out here, you know, you think, why isn't this water clean? And then um, we explain to them and tell them anything about deposition through rain. Uh, it really surprises a lot of people. Um, I think other pollutants might eventually get to be as serious as this, maybe pesticides or herbicides that have been flowing through agricultural areas, you know, those are other common pollutants that are being found in fish now and are just now 
starting to be studied more. So, um, but I think uh, mercury uh, accumulation is hard to combat because of the long distance uh, that a lot of it can travel through through the air. So is the mercury uh, level only related to the tropic level, right? Is that is that general statement correct? And if that is true, is there any pattern between you know native species versus exotic species? Is, is exotic species tend to be higher up in the tropic level, or is that? Uh, no, I wouldn't say the Oscar is any is, is higher than the large rock bass. Um, but if you look, there are actual species-specific advisories uh, by the Florida Department of Health for my cichlids. They also categorize them in with the similar warnings that they post for bluegill and warmouth, uh, some other soft panfish-sized um, fish that seem to be at the same trophic level and accumulate it at the same pace. Uh, but largemouth bass tend to grow pretty quickly, and the large ones, you know, accumulate it through their lifetime. And it has been found in other um, found to be causing problems in, in wildlife such as birds and um, and even panther, you know, they're found one panther that had died from apparent mercury poisoning. So uh, it definitely accumulates up the food chain every every um, one and um, they, they have they have advisories for different number two that are just about as equal, but nobody sense to really eat them so as frequently as they do the large pass. So like the mercury data, so I was so surprised that that many boat anglers, because I was sport fishing, like 30% of the fish, right? So um, pretty yeah. one in three. So how many do you estimate of like your, how many of them are consuming one of the advisor? Because they're supposed to consume one fish per month, right? Well, that's where it gets a little um, foggy too, is that it's not necessarily one fish of any, of any type, because you can combine and mix and match some types of fish, like you can have two to three warmouth per month, or you can have or you can have one bass per month. So, um, you know, a majority of them didn't keep them, uh, but I do have a table, um, I think it's in this, no, this is the demographic. Uh, it does show that the, the mean, there is a difference, significant difference in the mean meals per month that a canal bank angler eats and the uh, and the boat anglers do. If you if you just consider those who do eat fish and then and find their means, um, I think boat anglers consume uh, on average 1.1 meals per month, and uh, canal bank anglers eat I think 1.6 meals per month. So if you consider what one of those meals would be considered, how many fish that would be, that would mean that you know they'd probably all be right about at that level of so they're exceeding their their level of mercury per month, according to the EPA. Most of them. Yeah, the, the average. In the survey, you, you did have the different variable, right? Yes. You did that. So you did not include that in the division one? Oh, no, it was just, income. It just dropped out. Income dropped out okay. um, for the non native species issue. Um, when it came to the mercury advisories, um, it did show up in the canal bank anglers' awareness. Um, but, but at the same time, the, the highest bracket of 60,000 or more weren't statistically more significant to be more aware. Uh, but for some reason, the, the, the income bracket between 40 and 60,000 was more, a couple times, three, three times more aware than, than those that made less than 20,000. Same uh, is the truth for both uh, native and native uh, you mean, I mean the income? Did the income have a similar impact on the No, the income system? dropped up for, for the non native awareness of the dropped. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, you mentioned negative uh, effects by anglers because of like competitive interactions with their target species. Did they mention anything kind of like, it's like a nuisance, like bycatch, like throwing a good fishing experience? Or? Uh, yeah, well, for some reason, people really hated. Uh, gar. Oh, they, so they, don't like that. they really hate gar. Um, some of them really don't like both thing either. It's kind of sad to see a lot of them tossed up on shore as if that's going to make big differences. I think it's a fish to catch. I don't like catching, you know, it's a fish. Um, but, you know, when the people did say positive things about the non native, typically I found maybe two people that said that they were fishing specifically for Oscars at Holiday Park. 
And uh, but most of the time, when anybody said a positive thing, or actually that was the when I got the, the category of positive and negative opinions, was mostly boat anglers who said, "I hate I hate the non-natives except the peacock bass. I love the peacock." And that was usually the, their conflict of opinion. You know, some of them were like, "I wish, you know, I wish I didn't," but you know, they're like, "I, I do like the peacock bass. You know, this is a fun fish to catch." One more. Uh, so I heard like uh, Phil Stoddard, who was the mayor of Miami for a while, said like during the, still the mayor. Uh, I said like during tough economic times, there was like tons of people that live in Miami that were like totally fueled on eating canal exotics. So given this, like they would starve, but they didn't have it. It sounded like should how should we manage for that? Well, I mean, really the. the I don't know if there's a real solution that's ever going to happen to eradicating eradicating this at all. Um, you know, there's the backfill projects that they have in the canals that are going to experiment at hopefully the lower temperatures will do a better job of killing them. But I think, you know, if, if it weren't for the non natives such as the Oscars and the Mayan Cichlids, who I think there's more evidence about them than about competing, if it wasn't for them, I, I have a feeling that the, the, from stories, you know, all their stories you hear is that in the past, bluegill and other sunfish used to be probably just, just as plentiful. You know, so I have a feeling if, 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 it weren't for, if the non-natives were gone, I have a feeling a lot of the natives would probably rebound to some of their story levels. The, the giant bass that we used to hear about. Is Jim Stada talking about fish or those spooky ducks? Oh, I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I think he had a reputation to uh, actually eat those. If it was spooky ducks, then he had to eat them. Which is not exactly. That's really what he was talking about. Did you get a sense that people, the anglers, the canal bank anglers that are eating, is that a huge part of their, their you know, uh, they do it on a, on a need basis? Or? Um, I didn't ask them if anything about need, um, but I mean about half of them said that they were kind of keep fishing for, for food. And uh, you know, I think that they, a lot of times they prefer the big fish too, which is one of the things that puts them at more risk is that the advisories usually limit the sizes of the bass to keep at 12 to 14 inches, but when someone catches a big fish, those are the ones they want to keep the most. And um, fortunately, a lot of them out there too exceed their limit that they should be keeping. So, um, you know, a lot of them are really dismissive of the advisories too. Uh, they, yeah, I've heard things about if you soak them in coca-cola or milk or lemon juice or you can scrape the mercury off their bones with a knife um, <laughs> you can see if, if this if the muscle is too shiny that means you should you know throw it away a lot a lot of different things that people come up with that they think is is the best way to find out and a lot of them say you know i've been eating these my whole life or my my grandfather here has been eating them this whole life and he's fine they say they're not glowing green it's like radioactive thing. <laughs> so uh, there could definitely could be a lot more information. You said you did not find the mercury advisory sites uh, at all, or? Uh, it used to be. Yeah. It used to be. Yeah. And I've been asking them, talking to them too, they'll say, yeah, there's no signs out here. Anyway. But I agree there. No. Like how, how, 20 years ago, they made yeah. that. There was a huge article on mercury and bugs, actual bugs, and I think yeah, I get it somewhere. I can see yeah, it's a ramp. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it seems like from talking to people too is that it was a bigger deal 10, 15 years ago. More people were probably maybe they thought that after it faded away, that it was a scare tactic or something. Um, but it seems like a lot of people remember that it was used to be a big deal, but. You know, some people, you know, maybe uh, people destroyed the science or something like that. I don't know, but um, yeah, I, I was out there for a year and went searching every, every location, even at Holiday Park. I was, but if you go across the street at Everglades National Park, it's posted right away. It's mandated that they that they post advisories. So um, I don't know if it's a issue with or just not mandated for the South Florida Water Management District or or who it is that would be responsible for posting the mercury advisory signs. There's a lot of ground to cover, that's for sure. 80, what, 80, 100 miles? Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, I was just in the 22 mile. Yeah. Great. Any more questions? Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you. Thank you.